Good morning to our friends here in the States. Good afternoon to our friends in Israel. Shalom to all. I'm Alan Jay, Director of Outreach and Engagement here at the Zionist Organization of America. On behalf of ZOA and our partner organizations, Yesha Council, My Israel and the Shiloh Policy Forum, I would like to welcome you to this, the second installment of our three-part mega event, Judea and Samaria and the International Law. And if you have not already, you, want to, you won't want to forget to register for next Sunday's event, Paradigm Shift Toward a New Middle East. All microphones, with the exception of those of our panelists, will be muted for the duration of the program. We have a tight schedule today, but we will try to get to some questions from the audience toward the end of the program. If you have a question for our panelists, please post them in either the Zoom Q&A or chat feature found in the middle bottom of your screen. Yoni Kempinski immigrated from Toronto, Canada to Jerusalem in 1985. He served in IDF intelligence and later joined Arut Sheva as a video producer and anchor of programs aimed at connecting with Jews in the diaspora. Yoni is currently the Arut Sheva English website editor and will be our host for today's event. Yoni, it's my honor and pleasure to hand the program over to you. Thanks, Alan. So good evening. Good evening, Israel, and good morning, USA. Welcome to the second session of the Judea Samaria virtual mega event. This international conference is brought to you by the Yesha Council, the ZOA, the Shiloh Forum, and Israel Sheli. It's being broadcast live by Zoom, Facebook, and on the Arutz Sheva website. As uh, you said, Alan, I'm Yoni Kibitsky, editor of the Arutz Sheva English website. So last week, with hundreds of participants, we delved into the topic that will shape the future of the region, the economic peace. With us uh, to discuss this important uh, topic were President of Israel, Ruven Rivlin, Israel's ambassador to the UN and USA, Gilad Erdan, ZEO President Morten Klein, Yesha Council CEO, Igal Dilmoni, Head of Israel, Sheli Sarah Etzni Cohen, Dr. Echiel Leiter of the Shiloh Forum, Yaakov Berg, owner and manager of the Psagot Winery, and Avi Zimmerman, president of the Judea and Samaria Chamber of Commerce. You can watch last week's session on YouTube by clicking on the link, which will now appear on the comments below our current live feed. By the way, following the success of these online sessions, the option of adding a fourth online conference is being le uh, looked into. Stay tuned. Uh, uh, stay tuned. Updates will be sent later. Okay, so today on our second session, we'd like to go in deeper and discuss our past and present here, and this of course shapes the future. Words like, you know, the occupied territories, the West Bank, and other terms coming from the left agenda are meant to weaken the feeling and belief in the right of the people of Israel to the entire land of Israel. Last week, the International Criminal Court, the ICC in The Hague, the chief pro prosecutor of the ICC, Fatua Ben Souda, announced that the ICC will investigate the settlement and military activities of Israel in Judea and Samaria. This reflects the anti-Semitic and false international attitude, according to which the Jewish nation has no rights to Judea and Samaria. So today, we'll discuss this legal issue of the right to the land. It's not only from the historic and heritage-related angle, but rather also the legal international law aspect. Public, public figures and experts will relate to this topic and enlighten us all with information and understanding. It is crucial that each and every one of you take this information to spread the truth and defeat ignorance. I have the honor now to open today's session of the Judea and Samaria virtual mega event with Israel's Minister of Diaspora Affairs, Knesset member Omer Yankilevich, speaking to us from Mount Kabir in Elon More in Samaria. Hello, everyone. It is my privilege to join you today for this Yudavishawan virtual mega event. A few days ago, the International Criminal Court published their extreme ruling, which allows for the prosecutions of the State of Israel for war crimes. Besides its legal absurdities, this decision undermines our internal connection to our land. Among the many narratives, there is one truth. I stand on Har Kabir. Behind me is the path the Jewish people took to enter the land of Israel. And in front of me is Ar Grizim and Ar Eval. This is where the people of Israel stood 
3,000 years ago and committed to becoming Mamlechet Kohanim, the Goy Kadosh. We declare proudly that no court ruling can undermine this bond. With every step we take in this land, we feel the power of history, which we connect to our common destiny. Throughout history, Jews, Jews worldwide prayed and dreamt to return to this land. This desire is a source of our strength and unite us as a people. In recent months, I worked to support young settlements. The pioneers who build these communities are dedicated to strengthening our bond to the land and safeguarding the state of Israel. Our message today is clear. We will continue to solidify our presence here and our connection to the land of Israel. Thank you, Moetzet Yesha. And Zionist Organization of America, the Shiloh Forum, and Israel Shali for sponsoring this important event. Am Israel, Leolam Lo Yakovesh Be'eretz Israel. Thank you very much, Minister Yankilevich. Indeed, our historic birthright to the land is felt and expressed by the heritage sites throughout the land of Israel. The Esha Council is the umbrella organization of the local municipalities in Judea and Samaria. The Esha Council is involved in developing the area, in telling the story of Judea and Samaria to the world, and of course, in working with the government of Israel in benefit of the region. As part of their activity, the Esha Council decided to initiate this important mega event. David Elchiani is, first of all, a man of the land. He's been involved in agriculture for years as a resident of the Argaman Moshav in Jordan Valley. Elchiani has been the head of the regional council of the Jordan Valley for 12 years. And a year and a half ago, he was elected by the heads of the regional and local councils as chairman of the Yesha Council. I have now the honor to invite Yesha Council Chairman David Elchiani to address our conference from his office in the Jordan Valley. Hello everyone, my name is David el -Khayani. I am the head of the Jordan Valley Regional Council and the chairman of the Yeshev Council since 2019. We have two main goals, one political to promote the status of the communities and apply Israel's sovereignty in Judea and Shomeria, the other to improve the quality of life of our residents and reach the goal of one million residents in Judah, Shumeria, and the Jordan Valley. 2020 was a special year. On the one hand, we lost the sovereignty. And on the other hand, we prevented the possibility to establish a Palestinian terror state in the heart of the state of Israel that could endanger our existence as a Jewish people. It has also been the year of the Corona and social distance has affected everyone as well as the fact that we communicate now by digital means. We love you and we are waiting for the moment when we can meet again, hug and come to visit the Bible land at Israel. For us, your support is important and it is sort of our inspiration for the activities it motivates our souls. I thank everyone who participated in this important conference for the Israeli communities in Judea and Shumeria and the Jordan Valley. I wish you all the best and health. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. The Zionist Organization of America, ZOA, is the largest Zionist organization in the US. Our mega event is the result of the cooperation with the ZOA, and especially thanks to the energetic activity of the organization's representative in Israel, Dan Iluz. Dan will now share with us a few words in honor of our event and also talk about the way we should be looking at the region. Dan. Dear friends, my name is Dan Iluz, and I am ZOA's representative in Israel. I want to start by thanking our partners at the Yesha Council, My Israel, and the Shiloh Forum. We have been working hard together over the past few months 
to bring you the very best speakers on the important topics discussed in this conference. Today, we are speaking about international law and our rights to the land of Israel. I think that most people here today understand the historical rights of the Jewish people to their land. After all, this land is where King David ruled and where the Jewish people flourished 2,000 years ago. However, our rights are not only historical or religious. Our rights are also legal. The land of Israel was mandated to the Jewish people in San Remo over 100 years ago. And ever since, no legal action changed this status. In 1948, Jordan occupied part of this land. And in 1967, it was liberated by its rightful owners, Israel. Even though those facts are clear, the international community keeps talking about the so-called occupation of Judea and Samaria, calling it an illegal occupation. The way international law is warped and used to attack Israel is dangerous not only for Israel, but for the world as a whole, because it makes international law a joke. Last week, we heard the International Criminal Court claim it had jurisdiction over the so-called war crimes of Israel in Judea and Samaria. This is crazy. Not only are the, are the claims of war crime false, the singling out of Israel is nothing more than pure anti-Semitism. Yes, international law is used to promote anti-Semitism. In a world full of violent dictators, the ICC feels that Jewish homes being built in the Jewish people's historical homeland is the pressing issue of the time. Not dictators killing their own people or starting wars, but democratic Israel building homes. As an officer in the IDF advising the army on international law, I have seen firsthand how Israel does more than any other army in the world in order to safeguard international law. To be honest, I personally sometimes feel that Israel does too much. When the international community singles us out, they give a clear message to the world that trying to abide by international law will not help. They tell tyrants that there is no use to try and follow these laws because even democratic Israel that is law abiding is being attacked. Yes. The ICC, the UN, and all of these international bodies are, in practice, incentivizing war crimes. Today's session will take a much deeper look into international law issues that relate to Judea and Samaria. We hope to give you the tools needed to make the case for Judea and Samaria in America, a case that right now too few people are making in the United States, and I am proud to be a part of the ZOA the main organization making this case in America. Enjoy today's program and make sure to take in all the information in order for you to become an even greater defender of Israel. Thank you. Okay, okay, thanks, Dan. And now to the second part of our session, a panel of legal experts who will discuss the legal rights of the Jewish nation to the land of Israel. This panel will be directed by ZOA Chairman Attorney Mark Levinson. Mark, floor is yours. Okay. We good? Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm Mark Levinson. I am chairman of the Zionist Organization of America and very pleased and honored to be chairman of the Zionist Organization of America and pleased to be here today to help moderate this panel. We have three terrific speakers. I'm going to introduce the speakers and then we will go to our Q&A with them. Our first speaker is Chevrat Knesset, Michal Kotlewunsch. She's a member of Knesset in the Israeli parliament. Um, uh, she is chair of the Israeli Diaspora Relations Committee. 
She's a member of the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee, and she's a member of the Immigration, Integration, and Absorption Committee. She is an international lawyer with expertise in international law and human rights, and has been active in efforts to combat anti-Semitism and disinformation. Our second speaker will be Professor Eugene Kantorovich. He's the director of the Kohelet Policy Forum and the director of the Center for Middle East and International Law at George Mason University's Scalia Law School. On a personal note, Eugene and I have worked together extensively on New Jersey's, on New Jersey's anti boycott divestment sanctions legislation. And it's really a privilege and honor to have him here with us as well. Lastly, our third speaker is Dr. Manuel Navone, who is a professor of international relations at Tel Aviv University and at the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya. Professor Navone is also a fellow at the Kohelet Policy Forum and at the Jerusalem Institute of Strategy and Security. He recently published a new book, The Star and Scepter, A Diplomatic History of Israel that's available on Amazon. And we're gonna to try to get you that link on the chat later today. So here we go. We're gonna start with a different question for each of our panelists. And we've asked that they would spend four to five minutes on each question. And then we'll go to a question to the group at large, which we'll ask them each to answer. So. The current Knesset that you are part of came the closest ever to applying Israeli sovereignty to Yehud and Shomron, Judea and Samaria. This is something that we at ZOA openly support. And you probably saw our campaign around Jerusalem expressing this clear view. The issue is strongly linked to the legality of these areas. What is a legal justification for such a move? And also, if you can also, in your four to five to six minutes, is it politically feasible, both with respect to Israeli politics and international relations? So first of all, thank you very much, Mark. And thank you for everyone um, that's here. Thank you for my co-panelists um, and for the opportunity to engage on this very important topic uh, at an important time, I think, in, in, in Jewish history, in our collective history. Um, so first of all, Dan referred to the San Remo conference, of course, you know, as the source of, you know, the legality of what we speak about tonight. Uh, but, 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 but in addition, you know, it's very important that we acknowledge um, uh, Edmund Levy, uh, the report written by, by, you know, in, 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 or published in 2012, rather, um, finding that the construction of Israeli communities in Judea and Samaria are a matter of Israeli legal jurisdiction, and that Israelis have a legal right, of course, to settle there. What I would, you know, sort of um, address in this context and in the context of the outgoing Knesset is the imperative to, or, you know, at least as I see it, the imperative to understand that the gap between reality on the ground and its legal manifestation is bad. It's bad for everybody and it's ongoing for a very, very long time. The application of law, the application of sovereignty are very, very important in order to adjust what we know of as reality on the ground. And by the way, the growing gap between the legality or the lack of application of law or sovereignty and the reality on the ground actually leaves a lot of room for misconstruction, misunderstanding, and abuse. In many ways, and um, Dan also referred to the ICC, the recent ICC decision, but the war waged on the state of Israel, and you know we can argue when that was, but let's say it was in Durban of 2001, which we sort of missed. The war waged on the, store, uh, on the state of Israel uh, that includes the implementation of legal mechanisms and utilization of legal institutions in order to combat for public opinion vis-a-vis um, -vis the state of Israel, to undermine Israel's right um, to exist as what it is, as Jewish and democratic. I believe that it's a war that we haven't addressed properly. And we can talk about you know, the responsibility of other countries and so forth. But I would like to focus for a little bit on the imperative of Israel's government and Israel's Knesset to take part in the discussion affirming or reaffirming international law, which it respects and abides by, and utilizing the language of rights, the lingua franca 
spoken by both our friends and our foes around the world. And the fact that for the first time, actually, in addition to, you know, indeed the committees that you mentioned that I've sat on in this outgoing Knesset, I am a first time appointee to all matters related to the ICC within Knesset. The first time that Knesset members were actually engaging, or, you know, at least we began the process of engaging with the issues of the international institutions, of the imperative, of the importance of our um, ability to engage with our fellow parliamentarians around the world. And there are formal opportunities and informal opportunities, whether it's friendship groups or various um, parliamentary, you know, the parliaments of parliaments, whether it's the European parliament and, you know, SCE, IPU, various um, um, uh, organizations that enable us to address these issues, to raise these issues with our parliamentarian colleagues from around the world and for us to take part in this discussion or whether it's in the committee hearings that you mentioned and uh, some of our viewers may not be aware but a lot of the work that's done in Knesset it's not just a legislative branch of course it has supervising powers over the executive branch and the importance of what I call in Hebrew ribonut to the sovereignty of consciousness not only sovereignty of geography the importance of understanding that it's 72 and we're still a work in progress a young country but we are are still the founding generation, 72 years later, the imperative of understanding that what sovereignty looks like beyond geography is an understanding that we must take responsibility for everything that happens, including this issue, not only, but including this issue of whether um, we call it application of law or application of sovereignty, that is the responsibility of government to create the long-term holistic plans that address these issues, that enable that application of law, and that the law actually, um, or as I said, the Edmund, the Edmund Levy report enables us to do, but we have to create the infrastructures to actually go through the process. So the fact that it's legal is not enough. The fact that uh, the supervising ability of, let's say the Defense and Foreign Relations Committee uh, um, is, 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 is one that rather than constantly supervising how this is um, put into place, um, insufficiently, by the way, both in terms of numbers of, you know, the, 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 um, the uh, yeah, let's call it the bureaucracy that's necessary in order to put this into place. That is something that we must take responsibility for. And we must take responsibility for it, not only as government, but as Knesset members. Um, of course, I mean, we could talk about, uh, uh, and maybe we will a little bit later, the implications of not doing so. So what we saw at the ICC the other day, or you know, last Erev Shabbat, as opposed to this past Erev Shabbat, another important decision, um, and 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 um, and and um, excuse me, a nomination, a rather appointment of a new prosecutor. But what we saw last Erev Shabbat was actually the undermining of international legal principles of jurisdiction, of complementarity, and those are issues that the state of Israel must engage on on the merit with all trustees of international law and human rights, certainly with state parties, the Rome statute, definitely with the countries funding the ICC, and most certainly with the countries that submitted, submitted amici briefs, which the majority decision actually overlooked and ignored completely. Um, I refer to this last Friday night because we do know that there is a new prosecutor that's being appointed incoming in June, and I do hope um, that he will be able to um, launch the much needed reform, which the court itself um, has actually asked for recommendations regarding, not for the sake of the state of Israel, but for the sake of all that deserve and need its protection as a court of last resort, as a court that actually has a mission to fulfill, with it, which it is failing to fulfill with last week's decision, but an example of the ways in it with which it's failing to fulfill the mission, the vision, the values of the reasoning for the foundation of this court of last resort. Um, and maybe I'll end there, but the most important for me um, uh, um, to say perhaps here tonight as a member of Knesset, an outgoing member of Knesset, is actually the imperative for the state of Israel to reaffirm international law and to utilize the language of rights so that it can rise from the docket of the accused. And I think this is our time. Oh, one last thing, the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords um, actually offer a tremendous opportunity for us to understand the way forward. And, and I like to refer to the Abraham Accords as a fundamental pivot or a shift that enabled um, the shift away from rejectionism to normalization with a pivot away from the three no's of the Khartoum 1967 conference, no to recognition, no to negotiation, and no to peace with Israel, to the three yeses. Yes to recognition, yes to negotiation, yes to peace with Israel in that order. And without recognition, 
of the state of Israel's right to exist as Jewish and democratic, there can be no negotiation. And without negotiation, there can be no peace. And I believe that that is the fundamental paradigm shift that very possibly were inherent to the peace to prosperity plan as well um, in the eight conditions that had been you know, set in that plan. No matter the potential paradigm shift right there to me speaks volumes with regards to the issue we're discussing here tonight, recognition being the first step, recognition of Israel's right to exist as what it is, i.e. Jewish and democratic, not democratic state of all its people, Jewish and democratic, as a state that was founded upon the declaration of, of the principles of the Declaration of Independence, um, according to which an indigenous people returned to its ancestral homeland after thousands of years of exile, and of course, promises equality to all of its minorities and so forth. And so if I refer to the Abraham Accords as, as maybe that moment of a potential paradigm shift as we look forward, including with regards to the issue we're discussing here tonight, I do believe that they give us um, the ability, but also the responsibility to not miss the forest for the trees that we may have missed with, you know, the peace to prosperity plan, because this paradigm shift includes a complete transition in the way that we um, uh, enable um, the world to, to understand the challenge before the state of Israel and enable um, or make, uh, make accessible the imperative to apply the law, apply so sovereignty from that perspective, because in order to have peace with anybody, by the way, including the Palestinians, of course, there first has to be a recognition of Israel's right to exist as Jewish and democratic, including in the areas that we speak about, Judea, Samaria, of course, um, and the Jordan Valley. Uh, and, and of that, there is consensus in the state of Israel, enabling negotiation, paving the path to peace and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gavrat Knesset, to Michal Kotla Wunsch. And uh, we cannot underestimate the importance of the Abraham Accords. And we certainly hope the Biden administration will support the Abraham Accords and make that the emphasis, as opposed to some of the other items out there that we see a lot of uh, news articles about. Thank you. Professor Kantarovich, you're an expert in international law. It seems that international law is often used to attack Israel's presence in Yehud and Shomron, Judea and Samaria. We heard from MK Michal Kotlewunsch about the legality of these areas, and yet much of the world still calls Israel out for its presence in Yehud and Shomron, Judea and Samaria. Can you tell us about other instances of disputed territories in the world and how the world reacts to these other disputes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the main method by which international law is turned into a, a politicized tool against Israel is by taking the international out of international law. That is to say, it's just a set of laws about what should happen with Israel. Now, laws that only apply to one party are not, in fact, laws or international. Otherwise, um, otherwise the phrase international law is widely, is, is accurate. But it's not international and it's not law. If you, it, whenever you hear, um, whenever you hear <clears throat> an argument that something Israel is doing is illegal, uh, you need to demand examples of where analogous situations have been treated a comparable way. Now, so if someone says Jews are not allowed to live in Judea and Samaria, say, can you show me somewhere else where people have been said, where it was said that international law bars people based on their ethnicity from living somewhere? Now, a clever person would tell you there are actually some other examples, and I'll mention them. It's not, Judea and Samaria is not the only case where people have said that international law bars people from living somewhere because of their ethnicity. Um, they also said it about uh, Jews in the Sinai and Jews in Gaza and uh, Jews and go on. Uh, but that's, that's the complete list. But let's talk about examples that don't involve Israel or don't involve Jews. Um, there have been, uh, I don't believe Israel is an occupying power in the West Bank, but in fact, there are countries since the Geneva Conventions, which govern occupation were adopted in 1949. There have been numerous countries that have indeed occupied territory and held it for some period of time. And I have done a comprehensive academic study of, um, all of these situations. And it turns out that it is not uncommon for a uh, population to migrate from uh, one country that is occupying another territory into the occupied territory. It's not an uncommon thing, especially when they're next to each other. Um, 
the because people migrate it's hard it's hard to stop human movement sometimes it's encouraged by the occupying power sometimes it's not encouraged different kinds of situations uh examples that we see today include uh turkish settlers in northern cyprus syrian settler um turkish sent settlers in syria uh russian settlers in crimea russian settlers in other territories uh, Moroccan settlers in Western Sahara, uh, numerous other examples, and many examples in past decades. In not one single situation, not one single situation has the international community said that those people being there violate international law. Nobody has suggested anyone should be criminally prosecuted for it, uh, and, no one, uh, and no one has said that the Geneva Convention is breached by this conduct. As a matter of fact, on the subject of the ICC, the ICC is actually investigating Russian war crimes in Crimea, where Russia has uh, we're about 400,000 Russians, give or take, nobody's really counting. Uh, they don't have a uh, Shalomakshav like flying over Crimea, taking pictures of uh, houses being built. So several hundred thousand Russians have moved into Crimea since Russia occupied it in 2014. And the ICC prosecutor just decided last year that that would not be a war crime, at least not one worth her time investigating, hundreds of thousands in just a few years. So um, now these are all situations of actual occupation uh, where um, there is no claim to, uh, there's, no, uh, there's, there's no colorable claim by the occupying power to, to the territory, quite unlike Judea and Samaria, which was part of the mandate for Palestine and thus which Israel has uh, a clear sovereign claim to. Uh, which was not part of a prior country, unlike Crimea or Northern Cyprus. Um, so, but the situation, you might say, you know, people might say, well, the situation is very unique. Israel is sui generis. So let me tell you a story that would, would go like this. So in international law, the, uh, when a new country is created, its borders are the borders of the last top level administrative unit. So for example, in Canada, that's a province. In the United States, that's a state. In the Soviet Union, that would be a, there was a Soviet Socialist Republic. Soviet Union was composed of 16 Soviet Socialist Republics. Now, the, because you want the borders of new countries to be clear, that rule is the only rule that's applied. It doesn't matter the ethnicity of people who live there. It doesn't matter who's a minority, who's a majority. The borders are those borders. Uh, so in Israel's case, uh, those borders would be the mad borders of mandatory uh, Palestine. But let's assume you have a situation where you have a colonial unit, uh, part of an empire, uh, which, um, which has a significant minority of a particular ethnicity in one particular place, right? Let's say Palestinians in, in the West Bank, that has a, who don't want to be part of the new state, uh, who would rather be part of some other state um, or, their, or their own state, um, and who have a long history there. Um, but are none, nonetheless within these uh, borders, within the UT Potadetis borders. And let's say uh, that, those, uh, th that that group, uh, along with people, co-ethnic people from another country, um, like Arabs from other countries, for example, attack the newly formed country upon its independence to try to prevent uh, it from having control over all of the borders that it would be entitled to in international law to create a carve out and for this uh, minority ethnic group. And let's say that those countries are partially successful and they actually occupy part of this territory for 20 years, decades. Uh, so you have a country which, which on, its only claim to controlling uh, a particular uh, a territory uh, none of their, uh, they don't have people living there because all of their co-ethnic people have been ethnically cleansed out of it. Uh, they have never controlled it since independence because it was immediately occupied by neighboring powers. Um, and uh, the, uh, the ethnic group that lives there uh, is, uh, would rather not be part of them. So let's say that 20 years later, there's a war between this country that has this right based on international law, but which does, has never controlled the territory. And let's say it actually reconquers that territory. What would the international community say? I can prove to you that the international community would say it's not an occupation, it's completely legal. And because this is the case, of course, um, of the uh, Armenian Azerbaijani war this summer, where Azerbaijan retook territory that had never been under its control since Azerbaijani independence, 
where not a single Azerbaijani lived because they had fled or been expelled, and to which Armenians had a historic tie and which was populated entirely by Armenians who um, do not in any way want to be part of Azerbaijan. Nonetheless, the inter international community says, because the, that territory in the Gorno Karabakh was within the borders of the Azerbaijani and Soviet Socialist Republic back in Soviet times, those are the borders of Azerbaijan. And the fact that Armenia had occupied it temporarily does not mean Azerbaijan cannot retake it. So that's an example of nothing to do with Israel. Uh, very similar facts. And the answer comes out completely differently. Not a single international authority suggests Azerbaijan did not have a right to reconquer this territory, which it had never controlled and where no Azerbaijanis lived. Um, and then there's our case, of course, which is the exact, it's the exact same story I just told, fill in different names of the countries, you get a different result. Okay, that's, that, that, that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Kantorovich. And frankly, uh, Yoni suggested we may have a fourth panel. I would suspect, Yoni, that we should probably do a fifth panel to discuss just the issues raised by Professor uh, in this uh, segment here. Uh, I'd like to turn to our next speaker, our third speaker, distinguished Dr. Professor Emmanuel Navone. Uh, Professor Navone, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's recognition during the previous administration of Israel's legal rights on Yehudin Shomron and Judea Samaria was definitely a welcome move and one many of us so much long for these many years as a recognized rights we all believe in. Did it also have any effect at the diplomatic level on international relations or did it simply mean nothing? So first of all, good evening and, and thank you for, uh, for having me. Uh, I would say that the, the importance of the uh, Pompeo Declaration in terms of uh, diplomacy and international relations is that diplomats can no longer claim that even the United States considered Israeli settlements to be illegal. Uh, in uh, 1978, the uh, Carter administration had declared that Israeli settlements were inconsistent with international law. Uh, and yet in 1981, uh, the Reagan administration presented a different opinion uh, declaring that it did not consider Israeli settlements to be inherently illegal. Now, if you remember back in uh, 2004, uh, President George W. Bush sent a letter to Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon. It was on the uh, 14th of April in which he wrote that quote, uh, I'm quoting him, in light of new realities on the ground, including already existing major Israeli population centers, it is unrealistic to expect that the outcome of final status negotiations will be a full and complete return to the armistice lines of 1949, end quote. So obviously, President Bush would not have made such a statement had he considered Israeli settlements to be illegal. Indeed, this statement was consistent with UN Security Council 242 which does not require an Israeli withdrawal to the 1949 armistice lines and which was carefully worded precisely to leave some flexibility on the issues of borders. Now, six years later in July, 2010, President Obama refused to confirm his uh, administration's commitment <clears throat> to the Bush letter of 2004, which I just, I just quoted. Uh, on the 19th of May, 2011, Obama declared that, quote, the borders of Israel and Palestine should be based on the 1967 lines with mutually agreed swaps, end quote. Uh, and, and, and in December, 2016, at the very end of the uh, second Obama uh, administration, uh, John Kerry publicly changed the uh, Reagan and Bush approach by declaring that the U.S. government considers Israeli settlements to be illegal. Obama and Kerry uh, kind of translated this stance into deeds by not vetoing U.N. Security Council Resolution 2334, which was passed in December 2016, 
and which basically rejects the legality of any Israeli presence beyond the 1949 armistice line, including Jerusalem. And therefore, the Pompeo Declaration was welcome. Uh, but unfortunately, it can be overruled by the present or future U.S. administrations the same way that the Trump administration uh, overruled the position of the Carter administration. And so Israel should spare no diplomatic efforts to make sure that the Biden administration does not disavow the Pompeo uh, declaration. But the only thing that uh, would have a real effect in terms of international law and international re re relations would be to repeal uh, Resolution 2334. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is uh, unlikely uh, to happen. Okay, thank you. And, and unfortunately, we've already seen some, some troubling uh, comments out there that uh, you know uh, neither party should take uh, any unilateral moves. Uh, we, we saw the uh, new press secretary for the uh, president come out with that statement at least once last week, even late Friday, and I suspect we'll see more of those. So our efforts collectively and those watching this uh, program and webinar are very, very important. Uh, I'd like to bring a question to each of you and again give you four or five minutes each to respond to the same question. And just out there in the audience, we're probably going to go over 10 or 15 minutes. If you can all hang with us, we're going to go past the hour, 10 or 15 minutes. So the question to all of you was certainly referenced in our discussion so far about the uh, frankly horrific uh, ICC ruling uh, a week or so ago. Uh, so I'd like to ask each of you. Uh, last week, the ICC ruled that it had jurisdiction over so-called war crimes committed by Israel. I think we all agree this is an outrageous decision and that the singling out of Israel is nothing more than anti-Semitism. Can each of you comment from your perspective as to whether this decision has serious implications on Israel? And if so, what the implications are? And also to the extent you have any views on the new prosecutor that has been elected to replace really one of the more horrific prosecutors Israel has seen in recent history, whether you think that will be at all a, a, a helpful factor in trying to uh, tamp down this, this really outrageous decision. Kavrat Knesset, Michal Kavlawanj, could we start with you? Sure, um, thank you, Mark. Uh, so first of all, I think that the very fact that the uh, decision that we've been awaiting for months was published on Erev Shabbat speaks volumes in and of itself, just that. Um, I myself only saw, of course, the decision on Motzei Shabbat. I imagine that most of us um, here um, experienced it in much the same way. And I can tell you that it was very raw. Uh, it was very raw because um, of what Eugene spoke about at length and I think is very important. I happen to call it you know, double standards in, in, in many, many ways. Um, the application of legal principles when they are applied by singling out one country, any country, um, and inconsistently and not equally across the board, they basically undermine the entire um, institution um, um, that is set upon those principles. And that is what we saw happen with that ICC decision. And by the way, the dissenting view, um, and I think it's very important to read as well, um, Judge Kovach's um, um, dissenting opinion, it, of course, very clearly underscores what seven countries that submitted amicai briefs, in addition to international law um, experts submitted in their own briefs to the court, which were overlooked, ignored, um, not to mention who the court did consult with. And by the way, we have, have to reference that as well, because when we know that the court consulted with organizations that we can prove have connections to terror, um, I, I believe that the importance of this discussion has to be, as I said, about the international community um, and all trustees of international law and human rights. The decision about Israel is just an example. It's really but an example. And again, it may be the canary in the mine shaft. It may be you know, a part of a longer term process, which the ICC has definitely undergone. And we know that the ICC, I, you know, I spoke about it a little bit before, received recommendation, recommendations for its imperative reform. We basically know that all state parties acknowledge that there is a reform that is imperative if the ICC is to fulfill its original mission statement. But the very, um, the very decision 
undermining principles of jurisdiction, of complementarity, they affect the entire, the entire community or the entire family of nations, not only state parties to the Rome Statute, not only state parties to the ICC. They affect all countries, whether they submitted those amici briefs or not, certainly the countries that did, including Canada that sent in a letter um, reflecting its own um, understanding of jurisdiction, which was ignored. Um, they affect all those parties, all those countries that are the funding members of the Rome Statutes that are funding the ICC that must not only take responsibility, but hold the ICC to account. Because at the end of the day, we have to remember this is a court of last resort um, that enables those that do not have access to a court of law. Of, of, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, by the way, whose human, the human rights violations are of the grossest kind of genocide, of crimes against humanity, of war crimes. And with the limited resources that the ICC has to have made this decision is actually overlooking their need, is overlooking the imperative of the court to protect them, to uphold, maintain, and, and, and promote international law for their purposes in order to enable them equal access to justice. And I will say, and you referred um, to the um, uh, new prosecutor, and I will say that, look, we, we, I mean, you know, the expectations can be very, very high and um, the ability and the understanding and the um, uh, involvement of the, um, uh, you know, the prosecutor that was appointed of, of Karim Khan um, with uh, the ICC, whether it's with regards to the prosecution of ISIL. And I think that there is something to be said about that as well, because we are facing a very absurd situation. And we is actually, you know, and in his involvement with regards to ISIL, um, I think includes all democratic countries in that the application of legal principles of international law on what some call asymmetric sort of relations between a law abiding state and a terror organization or a terror regime, which mocks international law, but then utilizes the rights um, and the principles of that international law to undermine them. I think that is something that the ICC will have to address as well. Um, and and as, as do all countries, I do believe that we are, um, again, you know, the canary in the mine shaft in that sense. And if I mention um, in this context, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, of course, that the very fact that the Palestinian Authority submitted um, it's um, alleged um, accusations of the state of Israel in committing war crimes, of course, is actually a violation of the Oslo Accords, which are still the governing, you know, the governing document between us. And so again and again, this issue of double standards comes up, by the way, and if they're not held to account for a breach of the Oslo Accords and not held to account for a violation of international law, and we stand six and a half years after a standing violation of international law in that there are two deceased soldiers and two civilians that have been held in Gaza from the very same time of the 2014 Gaza war, and there is no reference to that. Well, it is time to identify and expose those double standards for the sake of all. This is really not about Israel. And it doesn't matter if the state of Israel is a state party of the Rome Statute or a part or a member of the ICC or not. I believe that we do have to engage in this, including with the incoming prosecutor. And, and the one thing that I will say, and I reflect, you know, I sort of referred to it a little bit before, um, the, the stance that he took with regards to the Yazidis, I think is one that's very important to note. Um, I think that it is a uh, reflection of a deep understanding of, if I quote Martin Luther King Jr., that the arc of morality is long, but it bends towards justice. And I very much hope that this will be perhaps the final opportunity, the last chance for the ICC to undergo the reform um, that it needs to undergo in order to fulfill its original mandate, in order to offer the protection to those needing its protection, and in order to be that court of last resort, that in a world where we all committed to never again in a world of again and again. And that's where Israel's um, involvement, because never again, of course, is a prospective commitment. It's not just about the past. It is about the present and the future. And when we look at the world around us and, and, and at the um, results of the double standards that Eugene spoke about many of, um, and the imperative to expose those double standards in order to actually fulfill the um, mandate that we set out, including through the ICC as one of the institutions of international law, that is our shared responsibility you know, as a member of the family of nations. Thank you. Professor Kantarovich. Yes.
Uh, okay, so about the ICC. Um, it's very terrible and very politicized, but I think it's also important to um, be calm about the ICC issue. That is to say, um, it's a bureaucrat, it's another international institution, the, like the UN, HRC, like UNWA, like the General Assembly, which has baked into its DNA uh, bias against Israel. Uh, unlike those bodies, it can issue um, arrest warrants, but uh, the damage it does is in proportion to the legitimacy it is given. And it needs to not be seen as like an international court. In fact, only half the countries in the world are members. None of those, uh, very few of those likely to engage in military conflict are, are members. Um, it needs to be laughed off as the dysfunctional uh, and corrupt institution it is. Right? In 20 years, they've convicted nine people. They uh, it's a bloated um, institution which uh, has no accountability. Um, and should be uh, laughed off. Uh, whether the new prosecutor is going to change anything, I wouldn't put my hopes on it because it's a bureaucracy. There's a, a professional culture there. There's a worldview, uh, and they share what I would call the UN worldview on Israel. One person's not going to make a difference. Uh, it's, it's a big train, and it's hurtling forward, and we need to be saying that we, we assume they're going to issue indictments. How do we assume? Because they're political, so we know what's going to happen. It's not a court where we, 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 we should say that, you know, we'll see how it comes out, which suggests that they're going to engage in some kind of deliberation or judgment. Um, that said, I think it's very important uh, what Mahal uh, pointed out. The ICC did not just, um, you know, throw a pin into the globe and it landed on Israel and they said, let's do Israel. The ICC was roped in to doing Israel. Now, they didn't have to do it, but they did this at the, the behest of the Palestinian Authority in gross violation of the Oslo. Uh, the Palestinians are basically seeking to have statehood, all of their borders established without any negotiations with Israel. Uh, Oslo specifically provides that the Palestinians have no jurisdiction in Area C. They have no jurisdiction over Israeli civilians. Settlements is not within their purview. All of that is thrown out the window. Uh, the Biden administration has recently been saying that they oppose unilateral acts uh, that would undermine the status quo by either side. Every day that the ICC is investigating this at the Palestinian behalf is the mother of all unilateral acts. And Israel needs to make clear that there's nothing even to talk about, not, you know, not building in Jerusalem. Um, in the name of avoiding unilateralism, a smart message for Israel to send is we, we'd be happy to discuss with the US administration what it means to avoid unilateralism. But we can't take it seriously uh, if the Palestinians are not punished for uh, continuing to be members of ICC and continuing to push, uh, to push this uh, investigation. Uh, they need to be you know, front and center uh, in this. Thank you. Uh, Professor Navon. Well, I think we need to understand that the uh, International Criminal Court is neither international uh, nor is it a court. Uh, as Eugene C. It, it said, it's a political body whose uh, membership is hardly international. It does not include uh, the United States, uh, Russia, China, India. Uh, nearly all Middle East countries are not part of it. Uh, and same thing about half of the African uh, continent. And um, as so many had feared when the, the court was established uh, back in uh, 2002, it has indeed been uh, hijacked by parties to conflict. The United States has soldiers fighting around the world and it understandably doesn't want them to be prosecuted by political bodies that oppose US foreign policy. By contrast, countries like Uruguay or Estonia don't run any risk by being members uh, of the ICC. Now, the uh, outgoing ICC prosecutor, Fatou Ben Souda, don't forget, got her job in part because the ICC wanted to play down the accusation that it was biased against uh, African countries. But there was no such bias. <laughs> it is because many crimes are indeed committed in Africa that a high number of probes uh, have been opened against uh, African leaders. 
And by the way, Ben Souda did not disappoint African dictators. Under her leadership, uh, the former Ivory Coast president, Laurent Gbagbo, uh, was cleared of crimes against humanity. Uh, the former Congolese vice president, Jean-Pierre Bamba, was acquitted on appeal and uh, Kenya's uh, president, Uru Kenyatta, uh, saw charges of crimes against humanity dropped. Uh, neither did uh, Ben Souda disappoint the PLO uh, by deciding that it has jurisdiction over Israel when it doesn't. Israel is not a member of the ICC, as was mentioned, and there is no Palestinian state. So you said, uh, we all agree this is an outrageous decision and uh, that the singling out of Israel is nothing more than anti-Semitism. Well, I agree that this decision is outrageous, but I don't agree that it is anti-Semitic. The decision does not accuse Jews of having hooked nose or uh, of dominating the world finance or of having a secret plan to rule over the world. Uh, I mean, words have a meaning and they must be used carefully. The ICC decision is not, in my opinion, a case of anti-Semitism, but a case of politics. It's about the PLO manipulating and hijacking international organizations to embarrass and to harass Israel. Now, hopefully, the new ICC prosecutor, Karim Khan, will not move ahead with the probe approved by Ben Souda. Uh, but for this to happen, Israel must be proactive and clever. We must rely not only on the United States, but also on Western allies that are members of the ICC, such as Canada, Britain, France, and Germany. Germany, by the way, has openly expressed its condemnation of the Ben Souda decision. And so if Israel wants to uh, secure a Western alliance against the hijacking of the ICC, or for that matter of other flawed UN bodies, such as the Human Rights Council, it must build a relation of mutual trust with the Biden administration, but also mend fences with Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron. France has many troops fighting jihadists in Africa, so, so does, does Germany uh, to a lesser extent. And both countries are aware of the dangers of a politicized ICC. And so precisely because the ICC is all about politics, Israel should use its tools and leverage in international politics to fight back and to win. Professor Navon, thank you. It's a very interesting uh, twist or point of view on that question. I know I personally have difficulty with the 70 years of, uh, I think, frankly, anti-Semitic uh, UN resolutions against Israel, 2334, the ICC court, the EU and everything else. I, I still don't understand how we can view it as anything other than, you know, hypocrisy, double standards, and anti-Semitism. But we will uh, advance that further in, in, in another discussion. Uh, we uh, uh, we're at the end of the hour, but I did suggest we we're going to go over uh, 10 to 15 minutes for those that can stay with us. We've had some incredible questions by folks out there in uh, in Cyberland. I'm going to try to include uh, uh, many of those comments in two questions. We'll do two to three minutes for, for each of you on these on um, these final two questions, if we could. So the first question, and I will start with Professor Kantorovich on this, please. The BDS movement uses the legal argument, uses legal arguments in order to call for a boycott of Israel. What is the best way, in your view, to defend Israel against those calls and efforts? And then after Professor Kantorovich, we'll do Professor Navone and then uh, Hebrat Knesset, Michal Kalawach. I don't know if I can answer that in a um, two to three uh, minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, um, they are first. Uh, there's two things. First of all, they argue that uh, Israel is committing various war crimes, which it's not. So that's part of the argument. Uh, and then it also says that you know if you think that Israel is doing bad things, you have to boycott it, which of course is uh, not the case. Uh, you know, the United States just said China's committing genocide, and I guarantee you, nobody's going to be boycotting. China. So they have to come up with some way to say whatever Israel is doing is worse than genocide. Um, but uh, the, I, I think it's just important to say what it is. I think that it's uh, anti-Semitic discrimination um, and that uh, there's no principle here. 
It's a continuation of the uh, effort to um, use economic means to snuff out the Jewish state that began with the Arab League boycott in, in the 1940s and uh, just been rebranded in human rights language. Thank you. Uh, rebranding, that is really a very important soundbite that we could use in our efforts to fight this. Professor Navone. So first of all, there are many legal uh, means to fight BDS and Eugene has, doing a great, has been doing a great job passing helping to pass legislation on that. But uh, I talk more about the political aspect of uh, this phenomenon. Uh, it's more my film. And uh, I'd like to remind all of you that Israel is not some kind of Jewish community in Poland. We are a major power. We were recently graded the ninth most powerful country in the world. Uh, and this is how we have to fight BDS. Whoever is going to boycott an Israeli company has to know that they will pay a higher price economically. Remember the, the whole struggle with uh, uh, Airbnb? If they know that they're going to be hurt more economically by boycotting Israel than by not uh, boycotting Israel, they only care about business and that's normal. You know, uh, they, they care about their income. And Israel is one of the strongest economies in the world. And so we have to fight as a strong country because we are, and we have to make these people pay the price of their folly. And as Eugene said, nobody's going to bother China about, the, uh, about Xinjiang because China is a superpower and it can afford to give a middle finger to the world, which is that which it does all the time. Uh, it, it is a, a huge economy. Uh, it owns billions of dollars of, uh, uh, of US uh, government bonds and therefore it can do whatever it wants. Well, we're not China, not yet, uh, but we are a major power. We are a very strong economy and this is where we have to fight besides the legal fight, which is also important. But as I said, it's also to make companies and actors pay the price of even thinking of boycotting Israel. Thank you. Perak Knesset. Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks. So I see BDS as just really one form of a multiple um, uh, pronged, uh, as I said, war waged on the state of Israel. That being just um, actually, it took our focus away for many, many years. I actually wrote an article called Forget About BDS several years ago, because I believe, and this maybe circles back around to um, where I, I um, agree and disagree with Emmanuel, and that is, um, it's the delegitimization and double standards um, that we also have to um, uh, hold ourselves to account to and view it as part of this multiple pronged war waged on the state of Israel. So when we say that the utilization of the law in this way politicizes it, or that the result is some will say anti-Semitic, it is because of, in my view, it's a violation of the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism, which includes the three Ds, the demonization, delegitimization of, and double standards of the state of Israel. Now, when we view that as the whole part and parcel of the IRA working definition, including the examples, the IRA definition in its entirety, I like to say, not just what's in the neat little box, um, which has been, as you know, adopted by about 28 countries, which is the result of a 20 year long democratic um, um, process, uh, which reached a consensus definition. I think it's very important that we understand it in that context. And in that context, speak to the double standards that Professor Kantorovich spoke about before, and not just singly um, the economic sort of, you know, boycott of a sanction element. What is important in that sense is that we stop this sort of double standard of ourselves, the hypocrisy that enables you know, certain countries to uh, benefit from economic relations with the state of Israel. And indeed, we're not China, we're not any other countries, but any other country, but we do have to identify and expose the double standards that in that enable the continued, you know, sort of um, holding the stick at both ends. Yes, we have economic relations with the state of Israel, and then we will pass 17 resolutions against it in the UN this last December, when seven resolutions are passed against the state of the world. When I say that it's time for the state of Israel to rise from the docket of the accused and to adopt a sovereign of consciousness, that's part of what I mean. And, and seeing it in the larger context with BDS, but one implementation of this strategy launched against the state of Israel, I think, you know, gives us a lot more tools in our toolbox. Okay, thank you. Our last question, and please take three to four minutes each. We'll start with Professor Navone in this one. Our last question, I'm going to actually pull from several items that uh, came in on the wonderful chat questions. I'll probably have two or three or four items in there. So please feel free to pick one of the two or three in the last question if you want to comment on for three or four minutes. So here we go. While we spoke of the legality 
of Israeli towns in Yehuda Shomron, Judea and Samaria. We also hear a lot about the illegal Palestinian building sponsored in large part by the European Union in Area C, an area meant to stay Israeli under Israeli control, even under the Oslo Accords. Why is Israel not acting against this? Also, around 30 years ago, Ariel Sharon perhaps was one of the first to champion the so-called Jordan option uh, to the issues uh, involving the Palestinians. And, and the third uh, element of this last question for you to pick one or two items for three or four minutes each, what specifically, given what we're facing with the new administration in Washington, what specifically can and should the Israeli government do about moving sovereignty forward now? Okay, we'll start with Professor Navon, Professor Kantorovich, and we'll finish with Chavrat Knesset, Michal uh, Kotler Wunsch. Professor Navon. So there were three questions. What are we doing with, uh, with Europe building illegal Palestinian settlements in Judea and Samaria? Uh, what about the Jordanian option? And uh, three, uh, how should we handle the uh, Biden administration? So on the first question, I agree that Israel and the Israeli government in the past 15 years has not done enough uh, to, uh, uh, to argue with uh, Europe, with the European Union and the major European countries that they cannot, on the one hand, uh, talk about upholding the Oslo agreements and not changing the status quo, and then being active in changing that, that status quo. Uh, they cannot, on the one hand, declare that they oppose uh, BDS, uh, and on the other hand, uh, fund uh, NGOs that uh, are active in BDS. They cannot, on the one hand, declare that they favor a two-state solution, and on the other hand, promote and fund organizations that uh, advocate the so-called Palestinian right of return, which is obviously inconsistent uh, with a two-state solution. And I think that all, the, all those issues, uh, Israel has not been forceful enough to make its, uh, its case. Uh, and uh, I agree that there's much to uh, improve on that. Regarding the uh, Jordanian option, uh, actually the expression Jordanian option historically meant uh, when it was uh, expressed and, 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 uh, and explained by Israeli leaders was the official policy of the Labour Party until 1988, which was to kind of find a compromise with the Kingdom of Jordan uh, to kind of return the, uh, uh, the sovereignty uh, and the citizenship of the Arab residents of Judea and Samaria to what used to be called Transjordan, uh, while maintaining Israel's military presence over most of the area. That was the meaning originally of the Jordanian option, which was officially dropped in 1988 when uh, King uh, Hussein declared officially that he severed his ties with Judea and uh, Samaria, and therefore it ceased to be an option. Today, just, just uh, expressing the idea in public uh, basically drives uh, uh, King Abdullah out of his mind. He does not want to hear about it. So the uh, Jordanian option became moot officially in 1988. And today, uh, I, it's something that the, the, uh, the sovereign, the Hashemite sovereign really does not want to, to hear about. The last point regarding the Biden uh, administration. Uh, I think it's a very clear case of the dangers of putting all your eggs in the same basket when you deal with the United States. Uh, we, get, we got a very good deal with uh, the Trump administration on many issues, but obviously, it goes to show that you should never be, burn bridges uh, uh, with uh, either political party in, in Congress. And we have to be, we, today we have to rebuild a relationship with, uh, uh, with Biden. We know that he hasn't called yet uh, the Israeli prime minister since, uh, uh, since being in office. Uh, as we know, there are also elections on the 23rd of March in, uh, in Israel. I assume that the Biden administration is waiting to find out what is going to come out of those elections. But yes, we will have to, uh, to build a relationship of trust uh, with the Biden administration to avoid a scenario uh, similar to what happened in December 2016, when because of a complete lack of trust between the Netanyahu government and the Obama administration, the Obama administration basically uh, allowed the passing of Resolution 2334 at the Security Council, which is a huge drawback for Israel. And in, in order to avoid this kind of scenario to repeat itself, we have to build a relationship based on trust. Thank you. Professor Kantarovich. 
We often think that things depend more on us than they do, and sometimes less than they do. Uh, in terms of Palestinian building illegally in Area C, it's completely our fault. Uh, that is to say, Israel has authority there. Israel doesn't exercise it. And that is a result of failure on a variety of levels. The civil administration, the branch of the military that deals with this um, is, I think, ideologically disinclined to, uh, to deal with this. Government officials are disinclined to deal with this. Uh, it, there's a lack of political courage. And of course, any such action would um, have a strong response from the US, which uh, I think going somewhat against Emmanuel's point, you can't, you, you, you can't knock down buildings in Area C that are built illegally unless you're willing to stand up to both Europe um, and, and, and the US. Um, I think the position of the Biden administration uh, on uh, Israel um, is not so dependent on anything we do, unless we're to do things really differently. Uh, the, the, you know, there's an idea that it's personalities, but um, it's not about Bibi and it's not about Biden. That is to say, Biden doesn't wake up thinking about Israel. Um, Biden uh, and uh, uh, um, Blinken doesn't, the Secretary of State doesn't wake, wake up thinking about uh, uh, Israel. The policies on this come from a lower level in the government. That lower level now has been staffed by BDS activists and people with a strong record against Israel as a, um, as a sop to um, the, uh, as a sop to uh, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. And if, if you're you know, a US politician uh, in the administration and you think you know, what's more important, the fact that you know, Israel makes nice noises or has nice manners when they speak to you, or that there's an ideology in the progressive wing that wants action taken and it doesn't matter you know, what, what Israel is doing short of complete capitulation, uh, so we have to assume America has a trajectory that's determined in significant part by its own internal politics. The whole point of intersectionalism is to link the uh, progressive attitudes to Israel with a bunch of other ideas. So unless we can like get in their heads and undo intersectionalism, you know, our, our ability to influence these things is going to be very much on uh, the margins. So again, like the ICC, we have to assume things are going to happen. We have to prepare for them rather than, I think, uh, hoping that we can fully avert them. Thank you. Michal, Akron Chaviv, you have the last substantive word today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And maybe I'll start with the end because intersectionality, and I like to say this in many contexts, we invented intersectionality. I think it's a very important concept for us to connect to and reconnect to. In many ways, the imperative to be informed, to understand um, uh, the challenges that Israel faces from the outside in. So with regards to the international processes as they affect us internally, to understand those processes, to engage with them. And I would say to engage the Biden administration very, very directly on these issues in order for, I would say, actually for the United States to be able to not only decide on its role and influence in the region and beyond, but really and address its own challenges, internal challenges, because we do face certain um, elements of international processes that affect each of our democracies. Some of them we see um, with, I would say, anti-Semitism as just the, um, the example or the predictive example of disinformation in general. And uh, we could talk about this if you have the next panel, but it comes into play in many, many ways. I do think that it's very important that we not only inform ourselves and engage, but actually expose and address the double standards vis-a-vis, -vis, um, we spoke about a lot of the international law principles, but vis-a-vis -vis what is happening with the relationship with the United States. I think that, you know, in that sense, the importance of um, um, uh, understanding that, and I agree with Eugene, that it's about the implementation of governance or lack of implementation. So I would say good governance, actually bad governance of us not taking responsibility of not um, uh, actually implementing the, 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 the responsibility we have as a government, as a country. And I would say in terms of the Knesset not overseeing that the government has not taken responsibility for far too long. 
And, and so first I begin always with us, what it is that we have to do. And in area C, that's very clear. I can give you some multiple examples actually of discussions that we held in the Foreign Relations Committee, um, even with regards to you know, the clearance of mines, which Israel is receive, receiving all kinds of you know, potential economic aid to receive, to, 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 um, rather than taking responsibility to clear landmines in areas B and C. I mean, that's preposterous um, as far as, you know, I think you know, in terms of, as I said, taking uh, sovereignty much more seriously than just the responsibility over geography or sovereignty that is geographic. Um, with regards to, to European funding, I think that it's very important that we engage with, you know, sort of following the money trail and begin to um, uh, engage the European parliamentarians and governments with evidence. And we and actually that's done. It's done primarily by non-for-profit organizations, of course, that make that information accessible, but to demand that they held uh, that be, they be held to account because again it's a breach of sovereignty and we don't speak that language when we don't speak that language we lose because both our friends and our foes speak precisely this language so when i say very generally that it's time for the state of Israel to affirm the principles um, of international law and utilize the language of rights so that it can rise from the docket of the accused. And I agree with Eugene, it may or may not have an effect on the results, but neither are we free to desist from taking the responsibility that we have and engaging in that way with both our friends and our foes around the world. Thank you very much. Terrific panel. Thank you, Michal. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you, Emmanuel. If you have a chance as we're wrapping up now, you can look at the chat line. Everyone thought this was a tremendous educational, emotional, motivational, informative panel. And I thank the three of you for that. Um, I also want to thank, in addition to our colleague at ZOA, Deanna Luz, I want to thank behind the scenes, Alan Jay and Natalie Lazaroff, who helped us pull off this program. And as I turn it back to Yoni and thank him, we should consider, we should consider if not 60 minutes overtime here in the future, we should go to maybe sessions four and five, because this was terrific. We've only scratched the surface. Yoni, thank you. No doubt about that, Mark. Thank you very much. And thanks to all our participants. I'm being told by the way, that we've had like around 400 uh, viewers online. Of course, this is in addition, we'll have the numbers of people that will be joining us. Uh, watching this, uh, you know, sharing it, watching the reruns and all that we'll have on our Rutsheva and all the social media. Uh, you, last week's uh, session can be seen watched on YouTube. Uh, today's session could be watched and most important of all should be shared by all our viewers uh, by clicking on the links that are also here on our feed and in the social media of our Rutsheva, Yesha Council, Yisrael Sheli and ZOA, of course, and the Shiloh Forum. Uh, so thank you all for uh, this amazing panel. You know, today's session taught us a lot about and gave us tools and information regarding our legal and historic rights to the land of Israel, especially, of course, in terms of Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley. This information is information that some try to conceal from us. Um, now, this information and more can be found at the website of the Esha Council, the Shiloh Forum and ZOA. Click in, read, learn, and most importantly, spread the truth. So thank you all for being with us for the second session of the Judea and Samaria virtual mega event. Next week on the third session, we will discuss the paradigm shift towards a new Middle East. The Speaker of the Knesset will be joining us as well as friends from the UAE. If you didn't register yet, please do so by clicking on the link under our live feed. And as I mentioned before, due to the success of these sessions, a fourth session, you know, as you said, Mark, maybe fifth and sixth, are being considered. Stay tuned for updates. Until next time, for me and the team, thank you all for joining us. Goodbye, and see you all next week. Shalom. Thank you. Shalom. Thank you.